Okay, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Keely Gideon Taylor. I am a member of the board of the Black Chamber of Commerce of Palm Beach County and also um, resource development chair. I'll be hosting the meeting uh, today along with Tracy Thomas. Tracy, please wave. Tracy is our office uh, manager. So thank you so much for joining our Ask an Expert series. Um, kicking off the 2021 year that is graciously sponsored by the city of West Palm Beach. Just some housekeeping rules. We do ask that when you are not speaking that you please mute yourself. Um, we like to see all your beautiful faces. So if you are so inclined, please turn on your camera and let us see who you are. If you have questions during the presentation, please put them in the chat. We'll be monitoring the chat during the presentation. Um, and I think that's all of housekeeping. So at this time, I am going to introduce our sponsor, um, the city of West Palm Beach and representing the city um, today is Mr. Frank Hayden. Um, Frank Hayden is the Director of Office Economic Opportunity at the City of West Palm Beach, where he specializes in working with small, minority, and women-owned businesses in the area of procurement. He's worked for the city for eight years. Um, the city was one of the first entities to step up and contact the chamber about sponsoring our virtual series. Um, so we are very grateful to the city. Uh, Mr. Hayden serves on several local nonprofit boards and is the past chair of the Black Chamber of Commerce of Palm Beach County. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome my friend, Bello Piscian, who just celebrated a birthday, representing the city of West Palm Beach, Mr. Frank Hayden. Thank you uh, very much, Keely. I, I truly do appreciate those kind, wonderful words uh, that you just shared. Um, as indicated, yes, my name is Frank Hayden, and it is an extreme honor uh, for us at the city to be hosting uh, this event today. It's, it's especially important in that what we have been going through, not only in, in the city of West Palm Beach, but in the country uh, with this COVID-19. Uh, and it's important that um, it is impacting uh, people of color and minorities at a greater degree uh, than some of the other populations um, in this uh, country and in Florida as a whole. And so one of the things that we at the city, um, and I've convinced my good friends at the Black Chamber, that we need to provide uh, information to our uh, citizens and uh, to our members of our committee, community so that they know the importance of receiving these vaccines uh, against this uh, virus that is impacting us. Because as you know, it has shortened the lifespan of uh, minorities. Um, and as I said, we die at a much larger rate. And I know there is some um, uh, reluctancy on the part of uh, people in the minority community uh, about trusting the, uh, the sincerity or the value of, of uh, these uh, shots. But I'm telling you, it is so much better than the alternative that will come about. So I'm happy that we here in the city, along with the Black Chamber, have uh, provided this forum today uh, to have our very distinguished guests uh, share with you the importance of uh, getting these vaccines and, and helping to squelch the uh, myths out there uh, that a lot of people are having uh, as it relates to whether or not they ought to uh, get this shot. So I'm going to get off my soapbox now um, so that you all can hear from the experts as opposed to uh, uh, my uh, mumbling about what I feel and do not feel. Uh, I take great pride in introducing to all of you all uh, actually a good friend, uh, Dr. Tiffany McCall, uh, who is an MD. Uh, Dr. McCall 
uh, from, graduated from the University of uh, I, Howard University. I apologize, Doc. Uh, we should all be quite familiar for this. That is where our uh, current vice president of the United States is a graduate of as well. Um, she also then earned her medical degree at Howard University at the College of Medicine in 2001. Dr. McCarl is an advocate of healthcare in the community. And because of that, she is very actively involved in the T. Roy Jefferson Medical Society, which aims to improve the quality of life of students and adults in Palm Beach County. And one of the other things that's, that's very crucial and important uh, to me is that she is a fine member of the Divine Nine of the AKAs, which my lovely wife is also a part of that fraternity uh, sorority as well. So without further ado, I'd like to take this chance now to introduce all of you to Dr. Tiffany McCall so that she can impart her wisdom to us. Dr. Good McCall. morning. I, I guess it's afternoon now. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so I am actually in my office and I'm actually working today, but um, I did want to take a few minutes to make sure that I was able to answer any questions if there were questions specifically. I'm pretty relaxed and laid back in, in, in terms of being a speaker, but the importance of what I was coming about today to talk about was really the importance of vaccination. So I think by, at this point, everyone is pretty familiar with what COVID is. Uh, we first recognized it a little over a year ago out of China, and we know that the virus um, is pretty aggressive and it has been rapidly mutating over the past few months. Um, so there are multiple different strains now. We've heard of the South African strain, the English strain, the South American strain, um, but ultimately it's all the same virus. And so because the virus has such virulence, meaning that it's able to infect people at such a significant rate, and because the virus also um, has a pretty high capacity for death, we take it very seriously and have taken it seriously. We've seen the havoc that it's caused across the country in part uh, due to our response to the virus, meaning that we had to close businesses down and uh, you know that has infected everybody essentially, um, but even more so the loss of life and the, the physical hardship and emotional hardship that it's caused on uh, our fellow countrymen. And the important thing though, is that we are at the turning point. And when I say we, I mean all of us, we are all at the turning point right now. And we all have the opportunity to be on the right side of history. Um, the virus has been here a little over a year. Um, and this is the fastest vaccination process that we've actually ever had in history. Um, but we do have a vaccination protocol now. We have multiple different types of vaccines available. Um, and so I'm not an immunologist. So my, you know, actually I'm boarded as a emergency medicine physician. And so I'm very familiar as a frontline worker. I also uh, work in wellness in my private office and aesthetics. But um, the important thing is that we do have options now. And I, I really wanted just to come on um, in this casual format to make sure that people understand that there are options and, uh, really just to encourage people to consider the options. I'm not here, I'm not a salesperson. My job isn't to you know, try to make someone feel like they have to get the vaccine, not by any means, but I do think that we can all agree that we have to get on the other side of COVID. So let's talk a little bit about testing. Uh, so we have a couple of different types of tests available. Uh, still, the gold standard test that we use is a PCR, uh, which stands for polymerase chain reaction. Essentially what that does is you take a portion of the virus. So what it's looking for is viral particles and you put it in a test tube. It's a very advanced system um, that multiplies the virus. So we're looking at the number of replications that it takes to then detect the antigen. And so the reason we use PCR as a gold standard is because it, will take it can take multiple passes of PCR um, to show any virus, but it, it should detect virus if there is virus in the system. Very specifically though, there are um, 
drawbacks and, and uh, fallout from any type of test that you do, even with the gold standard. So the tester actually is um, the first hurdle. So, you know, you have to have an accurate test and most people don't like them. I know I, I certainly don't either, but it really needs to be a retropharyngeal test. So kind of going back in the nose, people say you're touching my brain, but absolutely not. You know, we're not going anywhere near the main brain, but in order to get a very good sample, you do have to have that uh, posterior nasal swab. In addition, um, the other uh, type of test that we commonly do now is rapid. So there are rapid antigen tests, there are rapid antibody tests. And when we use the term rapid, we just mean that it's usually available within 10 to 15 minutes. These tests are not the gold standard. I repeat, they are not the gold standard. However, you know, by using this test, which is, you know, depending on the actual technique of the tester, the tests uh, go up to 88% sensitivity and the specificity is about 99%, meaning that if you get a positive on one of these rapid tests, with an appropriate tester who has cleaned the surface and washed your hands and that kind of thing, you actually have COVID if you have a positive test. But if you get a negative test, there is you know, maybe up to 10% chance that it was too early or you didn't have enough viral particles in your body to identify. So that is kind of just to clear up some of that myth or confusion related to testing itself. I do think it's important to, uh, to have routine testing and frequent testing this way you can prevent the spread. And so as we all are trying to get back to our normal lives, it is very important that we take care of ourselves, take care of our families, but we also take care of all of everybody else and that everybody else is our neighbor. And so uh, we encourage you know, continual testing when it's available. Um, outside of that, we mostly do the nasal pharyngeal swabbing still as the standard testing. However, there are other options being an oral sample. The oral sample doesn't have, um, it's not as sensitive as the nasopharyngeal swab, which is why most people still prefer the uh, nose swabs, but the oral sample is an option as well. Um, and does anyone have any questions about anything that I've said? Like I said, I'm pretty casual, but I wanna be sure that everyone's getting all the information that they need. For anyone that has any questions, you can raise your hand um, or you can actually also drop those uh, in the chat. Uh, there is one question in the chat. Uh, Doc, we have uh, Keely who is asking, is there a major difference in the three vaccine types? So, so yes, so yes, there is a difference, but I just wanna, I saw another question asking, is there, um, is there a, should you, should people still get tested even if they're asymptomatic? The short answer is yes. So the reason is this, you may not have significant symptoms of COVID or you may not recognize the symptoms that you have as being related to COVID, but it doesn't mean that you actually don't have COVID and that you can't expose other people. So if you are just sitting around in your house and you know, you're not going to, you know, say a party or fly on a plane or those kinds of things. No, you don't have to get tested on a regular basis. Um, you know, a lot of people do fine with COVID just, you know, by themselves at their homes. And that's appropriate. That's what we recommended initially. But if you are going to be exposed to other people, uh, things like flying, you know, weddings, which people are still doing, in-person gatherings, these kinds of things, you're going to see your family that you maybe haven't seen for, you know, the last year. I absolutely recommend testing for everybody involved, um, everybody involved. This is just to help lower the rates of transmission. Um, I saw another question, which yes. was, how long after potential exposure should I wait to get tested? So that's a great question. So when, when the virus first came out, we had models based just off of the cruise ships. Right, so that was our gold standard model. We said, well, you have to wait seven to 14 days and that is the longest, um, that's the longest time period that we would actually expect anyone to show symptoms. Most people after exposure show symptoms within three days. However, you know, in my experience, it's also been up to seven to 10 at the most, but that's kind of really the outlier. Most people actually will show symptoms very quickly uh, within the first two to three days after being exposed. The problem is that everyone doesn't recognize what those symptoms are once they've been exposed to COVID. So 
some of the symptoms may be something as um, innocuous as, you know, a little bit of extra fatigue, like you have a hard time getting out of the bed, or, you know, a little bit of muscle soreness, which could also be because you've exercised hard, a little bit of nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, sore throat. So the symptoms vary so much, and that's what makes it really so difficult to kind of pin down. And that is the reason that the routine testing is recommended, because it is very difficult to um, you know, say, oh, this is definitely a COVID symptom. The symptoms of shortness of breath, cough, and fever, I actually don't see that in most of the people that I test that are positive. And I, just as a, you know, as a side to, you know, be transparent, I also do a concierge testing through my private office calogenics, but, you know, most of the people that we see don't actually have fever. So I hope that answered the question. Okay. The next question, right. next question, Doc, is can you mix, mix and match the vaccines and will you need to get an annual booster shot or will you need okay. to get annual shots? Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna get to that. Just give me one second. I want to focus really quickly on part of the reason of the importance of early testing. And the reason for early testing is because if you have a positive test and you are someone that is high risk. So when I say high risk, I mean someone who is more likely to have a dangerous outcome with associated COVID, meaning you're overweight, you have diabetes, you have hypertension, um, you have asthma or underlying pulmonary disease, you would be a candidate for monoclonal antibody. And so we don't hear a lot of people talking about that, but the monoclonal antibody essentially puts you in a position that you develop antibodies to COVID so you don't get sick. So it doesn't mean that COVID goes away completely. I've heard people say, oh, I got the antibody and you know I still wasn't feeling that great or, and my wife didn't get it, she was okay. The problem with COVID is that we don't know how everyone will react to the actual virus. So what we try to do is if you are a high risk person, we will give you this antibody to reduce the risk of you ending up in the hospital, but you have to get it before you actually get very, very sick. So that's the reason that you, you're know, getting this testing before you're like, you know, 104 fever and, you know, can't breathe. By that, that point, the monoclonal antibody to prevent hospitalization is a little bit too late. So, okay. So moving on from that. Um, so in terms of the vaccine question, so I saw one, can you mix and match vaccines? Is that, that was a question, correct? Yes. Okay, short answer is no, you shouldn't mix and match. The reason is because these vaccines, so everything is meant to create an immune response. Let's just talk about how a vaccine works. So the vaccine does not give you COVID. Why does it not give you COVID? These vaccines that we're using today, they are not whole virus vaccines. So if you think of like the flu shot or like the early polio shots, those were whole viruses, meaning that if you give, a, give somebody a weakened dose of the virus, and they're able to make an immune response, which means that they could catch the infection if they don't have a completely intact immune system. Okay, that's not the type of uh, that's not the type of vector that we're using for the current COVID vaccine. So, no, there's no risk that you can get COVID from the vaccine. I have heard people say, "Well, I got the vaccine and then I got COVID." Well, yes, you probably got COVID before you got the vaccine, right? And so just because you get the vaccine, it doesn't mean that you cannot get COVID, especially in the first two weeks, your body has to have enough time to create an, an immune response. People don't necessarily feel perfect or wonderful after they get the vaccine, but it's not the virus that's causing you to feel bad. It's your body's immune response. Your body is recognizing this abnormal um, protein and recognizing it, right? As opposed to not recognizing it and that thing just multiplying and taking over your body. So what the vaccine actually does is it triggers your own immune system. So your native cells to get everybody mobilized, marching and, and working to create a really large immune response. So some of the common side effects from the vaccine are the same side effects that you can get with any vaccine, which include a little bit of fatigue, muscle soreness, some low grade fevers, chills, some nausea, um, I personally had joint pain and, you know, but truthfully, everything ended within 48 hours. Now, the reason that you should not mix and match vaccines is because each of these vaccines were created in separate labs and they're looking for a very specific immune response. So if you look at the data, um, although the vaccines that we have in the U.S. are similar in that they're mRNA carriers, the, the first two that came out, the double dose vaccines, um, the Johnson and Johnson vaccine that is now coming out, you know, has a little bit of a different 
uh, modality. So the important thing is, although we are eliciting an immune response, it's not the same exact response. So my recommendation would be to not mix and match vaccines. You know, it, to definitely try to get uh, the vaccine that you got. And, you know, the spacing is a little bit different depending on which vaccine it is between 21 to 28 days. Um, the studies when they evaluated people that went a little early or a little late, they still had, you know, appropriate immune responses. So, you know, if you can just you get in to get that second vaccine wherever you got your first one. And I saw another question, which was, after receiving the vaccine, can you still transmit COVID to another person? Well, Deborah Jackson, that is a wonderful question. Um, so the short answer is we are not 100% sure. At this point, we believe that although you do, you will have immunity yourself, there will be a very, very short window of opportunity where you could potentially have contracted the virus um, and could potentially transmit it to someone who was not vaccinated. This is the reason that we still encourage people to wear masks if you are around other people who have not been vaccinated. But if you are a vaccinated person, meaning someone who has already created an appropriate immune response to the virus, um, and you are around another vaccinated person, we consider that to be safe. So hanging out with vaccinations, I guess another reason to get the vaccination. Okay. I see another question. Is the efficacy between the first two vaccines, which are stated to be 90 plus, and the J&J &J vaccine, which is around 80, due to the J&J &J vaccine efficacy is affected by the new variants? Okay, so great question. Um, so we have, to, we have to go back to the studies. Now, now we know that all this all of these things are less than a year, right? So all of these studies are less than a year. When people talk about things like booster shots, um, we've only had literally one full year of vaccines and that's from the earliest infancy of trials. Most people, so when we talk about people, I'm talking about the general population, didn't start getting vaccines until December if you weren't involved in a trial, which means that we don't really know exactly how long that immunity is going to last. Uh, will an annual booster be recommended or required? Possibly. Um, I guess it just will depend on how long people keep that immunity. And as more information comes out, it will be released to the public and everyone is wondering the same thing, not just you. My hope and goal is that we get such a significant amount of immunity within the communities that we are no longer um, able to kind of carry the virus from person to person and that we're able to squelch it so that we just, we don't have, so part of the herd immunity that we talked about really early in the virus, um, if you remember, is that if someone has already had the virus or they've been vaccinated, they may be exposed to it again and that, you know, that may happen, but they will develop an immune response similar to the immune response you develop to the flu or you know, the, the way that the measles you know, vaccine worked. So your body's able to recognize it and it just doesn't kind of run rampant in the community. So people that are unable to get vaccinated, because there are some of those, you know, will still be able to, you know, kind of get out. So the other question was about the efficacy of the vaccines. Um, you know, the vaccine study isn't perfect. I've seen efficacy up to 95%. Um, I think that's wonderful and phenomenal. There, that what, what that means is there's still a 5% chance that you could get the virus, right? But the goal of vaccinating isn't, just that you do not get the virus, it's actually that you don't get sick and die, right? So we've lived with viruses for eons. So if you think of all the illnesses, you think of the Spanish flu, you think of the regular flu, H1N1, um, you think of some of the you know, measles, mumps, rubella. So we live with viruses. The goal is to make this virus not the virus that is going to you know, cause a significant mortality and morbidity throughout our population. So I do think that, you know, the virus efficacy um, is actually, it's actually better than what the flu virus efficacy was. Um, and, you know, we took that vaccine pretty readily just because if you've ever had the flu, 
you know how miserable it can be. Uh, and the same with COVID, if you've had COVID, not everyone doesn't get affected the same way, but certainly uh, you are able to create a much better immune response to the actual vaccine than you do to the virus itself. And, and that's in part of the smart technology that the virus has, which essentially makes your body not create this wonderful immune response. Okay, I see another question. How does COVID affect fertility? Hmm. So I don't have a fantastic answer to that. Um, I can tell you that you know, through the studies, we've seen that COVID affects pretty much every, every part of the body. People that have had COVID suffer from memory loss, um, emotional changes, hair loss, chronic muscle fatigue, uh, chronic cough and multiple other you know, types of issues. So in terms of fertility, I can't speak specifically to that because you know, we don't have a whole lot of studies, but you know, we have had, um, we did have kind of earlier just anecdotal studies and observational studies showing that you know, some people that had COVID like maybe decreased birth weight and that kind of thing. It's just not ethical to um, infect someone with COVID and then to see what happens to them when they get pregnant. So all of the studies at this point would really be observational. And um, you know, we, we would just continue to see what people are able to publish and observe. I have a question. Okay. Thank you, doctor, for being with us and giving us all this great information. Just curious to know uh, in your circles, in the medical circle, and as it relates directly to Black people, you know, what is the most reoccurring phobia uh, that we have with regards to our hesitations in, in getting the vaccine? It's mm, a great question. I think that... Um, Unfortunately, color and race is a thing still in the United States and in, uh, in a lot of different parts of the world. And unfortunately, because people weren't necessarily authentic and open about um, treatments, treatment options, um, testing, and you know, exposures, I think that the community in general has phobia and I can't say that it's inappropriate, right? So if you think back to the Tuskegee, in, uh, you know, Tuskegee experiment, or you think back to even how we know so much about cancer technology, that, that wasn't a consenting person. If you think back to how we even found out about anesthesia, those weren't consenting, consenting women, you know, that you know, were experimented on. If you think about even the first, um, you know, GYN surgeries, th those were not consenting patients. So I think that there's a historic um, phobia and it's not inappropriate. Unfortunately though, what we're seeing now is that black and brown people are the most affected by COVID-19. Part of that is underlying you know, illnesses such as hypertension, diabetes, obesity. Part of that is multi-generational living meaning that people live with extended families, parents, grandparents, and children. Part of that is diminished access to care in general. So, you know, some of that is uh, social, that people don't necessarily believe they have to go to the doctor. They believe that they can heal themselves as they've done historically or, you know, through the centuries. Um, but the reality is, is that Black and brown people are more affected. What I see in the emergency department is when people come in and they're super, super sick, they tend to be black and brown people. And I work in West Palm Beach. Um, our population is not majority black. What I see, I can tell you an anecdotal story of uh, a group of people that all work together, five people, they eat lunch together and they eat lunch together every day. 
someone had COVID, didn't realize they had COVID. I'm sure they wouldn't have taken their mask off if they thought they had COVID. But the five people then were affected. And I know this because I saw one in the hospital and then I saw two days later, another person in the hospital. And a few days after that, a third person in the hospital. Out of those five people, the only one that died was the black woman. She had asthma and she was overweight. Um, and these are people that I work with. So when you talk about the implications, they are significant and serious. There has been a campaign. T. Leroy Jefferson Medical Society has pushed forth this campaign. The Urban League has pushed forth this campaign. Um, there's multiple people that are kind of all on the same side that are encouraging vaccination. I got vaccinated. Am I a high risk person? I mean, it's my belief that if I got sick, I probably, you know, if I got COVID, I probably wouldn't get super sick. I don't have any other medical problems. But I got vaccinated because I couldn't in good conscience tell other people, you need to get vaccinated if I wasn't willing to take it myself. I am still of childbearing age, although I don't plan to have any other children. Um, but it is very, very important that we protect each other. And so some of that is you know, the spoken word. So I'm coming here today, taking time out of my day to let people know vaccination is an option. Getting COVID is an option as well, but unfortunately, I just don't think that's a good option. I, I wouldn't want that for my mother, my father, and I don't want that for any of my fellow community members. Um, we have to encourage vaccinations. And I think that people have been doing that. I think you know we've kind of partnered with a lot of the faith leaders uh, to kind of encourage vaccinations. We were heavily involved uh, as Team Leroy Jefferson Medical Society. So I, I serve as board president right now. Um, I'm very honored to be in that position, but you know, we have been involved in the campaign in Rivera Beach and in Belgrade, trying to get people vaccinated. But you know, everyone doesn't live in Belgrade, right? We live all over, people of color. And uh, the best thing that you can do is to get yourself educated, not not the, the negative stuff, you know, not just the vaccine is bad, it's gonna kill you, but truly do the research. And if you don't understand it, go to someone that does understand it to help them explain it to you and make yourself accountable to yourself and to the rest of the community as well. Thank you for that thorough answer. I, I appreciate the history actually that you spoke of as well and in terms of black people being used as experimental specimens for whatever the case may be. So I uh, learned something from that. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm pretty much done. So I just, you know, for me, I wanted just to come out and just to make sure that I was able to answer any questions. Um, and I hope people have gotten a little bit of knowledge. We do lots and lots of different talks. Um, the one thing that I think that people maybe don't know so much about is the monoclonal antibody, which is huge. It really does diminish, you know, the rates of, hosp the rates of hospitalization. So, you know, just wanting people to have some awareness. In our current area, um, that treatment is offered at Bethesda, East and West, um, and Wellington. Um, and Dr. Yemi Osiami, who is an infectious disease specialist, he actually offers that treatment in his office uh, through a trial and um, a trial where so you actually get paid to be in these medical trials um, or you know actual the actual antibody if you have a positive result. So, Doc and, and uh, Keely, if I might, thank you so very much. Um, I think this information that you have shared uh, today is uh, a wealth of knowledge. And as you said, it, it is not to uh, persuade people one way or another, but it is to give them the information that they need to be able to make a, a sound, rash, rational decision about the importance of uh, getting this, this uh, shot or, or not getting it. So. On behalf of the city of Detroit, and I will take the privilege of speaking on behalf of my colleagues at the Black Chamber 
uh, we are truly blessed and, and fortunate that you agreed to come and share this information uh, with our members and uh, with the public uh, in general. Uh, because as I said earlier, I think there's nothing more important than our people understanding the importance of getting this uh, vaccine in their system so that they can ward off uh, this uh, virus that's out there affecting. So thank you very much, Doc. We truly do appreciate it. And so Healy. Okay, thank you, Dr. McCullough. And also uh, on behalf of the city of West Palm Beach and Palm Beach County, I think Frank thinks he's still in Detroit, but we're in <laughs> Palm Beach. You, you, but, you, are, you are very true. That just, you know, after you've had, been in something for so long, Detroit. it just slipped. So I apologize. Yes. Oh, absolutely. And uh, on behalf of the Black Chamber, I want to thank the city of West Palm Beach for sponsoring um, today's Ask an Expert. And as I mentioned earlier, they have stepped up and they're going to uh, be sponsoring uh, three more um, Ask the Expert events throughout 2021. So thank you for that sponsorship. At this time, I'm going to turn it over to Tracy Thomas, who's going to highlight our new members. She will be followed by Grassford Smith, who is our board chair, and we will give you back your afternoon. So Tracy, you're up, followed by Grassford. Yes. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. We just are super proud and honored of our new members that we have that's joined over the last two weeks. I'm just gonna name off uh, these companies, uh, the P3 Group. Uh, we have the Palm Beaches, which is also known as informally known as Discover the Palm Beaches. Uh, we have CTOS Corporation. Uh, New York Life representative is Maureen McKenzie. Career Source of Palm Beach County and Dunstan Independent Insurance. We welcome any of you that are on this call that's interested in membership. You can join us. Our website is www.blackchamberpbc.com and we look forward to having you. Thank you, Keely. Am I on deck now? You are. Great, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Keely. Thank you, uh, Frank and the city of West Palm. Wow, this, this probably is the most in-depth uh, uh, talk I've heard outside of Dr. Fauci on, on COVID, particularly to hear about the impacts on uh, the minority community and that history that the doctor did such a good job explaining. Because I could tell you a lot of of, of African-Americans are very leery about taking the vaccine. So we need this information um, dearly. My mother always told me, you know, health is wealth. If you don't have health, you, you really have nothing. So we, we can't really talk about economic empowerment and all the things that the Black Chamber is focused on without really trying to have a holistic view of us as human beings and and what we're doing here in the community. So I really do thank the doctor for taking her valuable time to be here with us. We have a, a, a really exciting time uh, going on right now at the chamber. Great time to be a member. Please reach out to Tracy and she'll give you all the member benefits, which includes participating in programs such as this. We have the State of the Chamber event coming up uh, later on this month. I'm, I'm not live on camera now only because I'm, I'm triple booked. Uh, but uh, it was important for me to, to, to be here as part of this discussion and can't wait to see you all at our next program. And again, thank you, Keely, for helping us to organize this. Thank you. Thank you, Grassford. And as Grassford mentioned, um, we've got our State of the Chamber coming up on March 31st. Stay tuned for communications where we'll be installing our new officers and sharing our um, highlights uh, and successes for 2020 and our vision for 2021. Ladies and gentlemen, have a great afternoon and uh, we appreciate your support of the Black Chamber of Commerce of Palm Beach County.